Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Mackey. So here let's look at an interesting tale of two games, one of which made $28 million and the other one made $250,000. The lesson in this video is very important if you're trying to make a living from making games, you need to make sure to not make this quote unquote mistake. So the two games in question here are Supermarket Simulator. This is one of the biggest hits of recent times. It was a massive hit on Steam, tons of people and players really love it. And on the other hand, we have Bionic Bay. So this is an absolutely gorgeous game. It looks really seriously impressive. It's got some very impressive pixel art, the animations are really excellent, all the effects, everything, it really looks quite stunning. In terms of visuals, I would say Bionic Bay actually looks better, actually looks more interesting than Supermarket Simulator. But you can probably already guess what I'm saying. So Supermarket Simulator, yep, this is the one that made $28 million. And over here Bionic Bay, this one made about $250,000. That's a pretty massive difference between two games. And especially because one of which looks extremely impressive, extremely well made, very high production values. Whereas the other one honestly looks very bare bones, at least in terms of visuals. It looks quite simple, so it's quite interesting the story of these two games, how one found such insane success and the other one comparatively found much, much less. By the way, if you have no idea how exactly I'm guessing these numbers, 28 million and 250k, if so, you can go ahead and watch this video where I talked about how you can get a rough estimate to try to guess how much money a certain game made. It's basically all about the review count. There are certain multipliers that you can apply to a review count to get a rough estimate of how many sales the game has had. Now, of course, these are not the actual numbers. Nobody knows the actual numbers but the developers themselves. But still, we can get a pretty rough estimate that is actually going to be relatively accurate, at least for our use case. In general, the multiplier can be anywhere between 20 to about 70. So usually a rough middle ground is about 40. So the Supermarket Simulator with 65,000 reviews, so 65,000 multiplied by 40. We can guesstimate this one probably sold 2.6 million copies, which at a $20 price point, so times 20 would be about $52 million. But this one has been out for quite a while, so chances are a lot of those copies were not done at full price. Chances are a lot of them were at 50% off or something more. So you have this one probably made between 20 and $30 million. And on the other hand, we have Bionic Bay here. This one has 300 reviews. So again, 320 times 40, and we can guesstimate this one sold about 12,000 copies. And again, multiply that by the total price, maybe 250,000. So maybe it's sold between, let's say, 200 and $300,000. So again, it's just an estimate. Nobody knows the actual numbers but the developers. But still, we can be pretty certain that this game probably did not make a million dollars, and Supermarket Simulator probably made over $20 million. So the question is, what exactly can we learn from this? What can we learn from this sale of these two games? And for the most part, the answer as to why these two games had such drastic different results, the answer comes down to genre. This game, Supermarket Simulator, looks quite a little bit janky. The assets look taken straight from the asset store. The game visually does not seem interesting at all. The name Supermarket Simulator is a very generic name. So at a glance, you would think, okay, this sounds very generic, very boring. Whereas on the other hand, you've got Bionic Bay. So this one looks absolutely stunning. I mean, in terms of visuals, this is really gorgeous. Some of the most gorgeous pixel art that I've ever seen. Look at this, this also looks super stunning. Not just the pixel art itself, but all those effects. Look at all those missiles, that looks super cool. So in terms of the coolness factor, I would definitely give it to this one. But despite looking so cool, you really can't find genre. Supermarket Simulator might look relatively simple, but it's on the very hot genre, which is the simulator genre. Whereas Bionic Bay, despite looking absolutely excellent, this one is on the very limited the platformer genre. So that is the one quote unquote mistake that I mentioned in the title of this video. How picking the right quote unquote versus wrong genre is such a massive difference. So that is definitely one decision you should not take lightly. Now again, when I'm saying mistake, obviously I gotta put it in quotes. It is only a mistake from the standpoint of wanting to make as much money as possible, which is not necessarily the goal for these devs. I don't know these devs, so I don't know what were their primary goals for making this game. Perhaps they specifically wanted to make this game. And if so, then it's not a mistake at all. They made a game and by all accounts, it's a great game. The reviews are all very positive. So people do seem to really enjoy this game. And it did have decent success. Compared to the other one, it got a very low amount, but still, $250,000 is still a very good indie game result. And even though $250,000 does seem like actually a nice amount of money, which sure it is, it definitely puts it, I believe, on like the top 5% of Steam, something like that. So this is a definitely good amount. But of course, the way that you run any business is not just by looking at revenue. You've got to look at revenue and costs. And this game itself, this one was first announced, first revealed back in June of 22. And back then it already looked pretty nice. So in terms of visuals, it already looks quite nice. So this already had quite a lot of work put into it. So I would guess it, they were working on this game for about one year before this reveal. So they probably started working on it at about June of 2021. And they published it right now in about April of 25. So this game was in development for about four years, something like that. And as for the size of the team, over here on the press kit, we can see, yep, this one is made by a sole developer that was basically the creative director. And then a two-person team that was responsible on more of the technical side. So that's three people working, I'm assuming full-time for four years, 
So when you put them like that, then $250,000 suddenly becomes quite a bit smaller. You got to take those $250,000 and first of all, take away Steam's cut, so times 0.7. Then you're going to have refunds, chargebacks, and so on. That is going to be another 5-10%. Then you're going to have to pay income tax or whatever it is. So that is going to be depending on the country. But let's say it's going to be something like 40%, so times 0.6. So we're down to 100 grand. Then of course, you've got to divide for four years of development. There you go, 25K per year. Then you've got three developers divided by three. So you have to, that makes about $8,000 in net revenue per developer per year of work. So even though $250,000 does sound nice, and again, that still puts it on top 5%, so that's a really excellent result. I really don't want to diminish what these developers made. They made an excellent game that is absolutely stunning, that people absolutely love and did find quite a lot of success, just not as much as another game. But despite making such a great game that players generally love, despite that, it only managed to make about $8,000 per each developer. Now again, platformers actually tend to do better on consoles and things like that, so on Xbox, Switch, and so on. So hopefully this game might not be a huge hit on Steam, but hopefully it finds quite a lot more success, quite a lot more copies sold on consoles. And if so, perhaps through a long enough timeline, perhaps this game will actually end up being a very nice profitable project. I really hope so. Like I said, the game looks absolutely stunning. It is not really my kind of thing, but I can definitely tell there was a lot of love and care put into this. So I definitely do wish the best of luck for the developers. I really do wish that in the end, they do find that this project ends up being a success for them. So when I use the word mistake, it is really just based on that specific point of view, the point of view of trying to make as much money as possible. From that point of view, it's a mistake. But from the point of view of just wanting to make something that exists, then perhaps this was not a mistake at all. And perhaps it actually turned a profit for these developers. I always got to give that caveat whenever I talk about money related to games and so on. You have to remember how you can't just make games just for fun. You don't have to make games just for money. I made an entire video on this topic. I think this is something that is sometimes overlooked. Sometimes you can look on YouTube, on indie game development, Steam, marketing, that kind of stuff. When you look at that, it seems like it's all about the money. And for some people, it can be. If you're trying to make it as a living, if you're trying to make it as a business, then it kind of helps to treat it like a business and actually make an effort to try to make a profit. But the alternative, making games just for fun, that one is also perfectly valid. So I just want to make that disclaimer. The mistake in the title really just has to do with intentionally trying to make as much money as possible, which might not necessarily be the intent. But again, if that is the intent, if so, then yep, I would say this is a pretty big mistake, a pretty costly mistake. That is the mistake of choosing the quote-unquote wrong genre. If you're trying to make a living from making indie games, if so, then you have to pick the right genre. If your goal is to make money and you decide to make a puzzle platformer, if so, then you are basically playing on hard mode. Trying to find success with a puzzle platformer is going to be insanely difficult. There are very, very few that find success. Even this one, again, this is one game that has really excellent production values. And despite that, it still made a relatively low value. Whereas on the other hand, you've got these similar games. There are tons of these, and for these, you don't even need, as you can see, you don't even need super high production value. You can just have something that has a very interesting theme, and just an interesting theme that is likely going to be enough to basically get you a ton of copies relatively easily. If you browse the simulation tab on Steam, you can see examples of these kinds of games. And this is another excellent example, Schedule 1. So this is yet another simulator game. It's yet another game that came out and found insane success. This one, I believe, was just made by a solo developer. And I believe this one has made over $50 million, so it's an even bigger hit than the other one. I recently saw this really excellent video on YouTube, basically what type of indie games actually sell best. This is a really excellent video with tons of analysis on specifically tags and trying to find what tags, what games actually sell more. And here in the video basically creates this graph. And the blue dots, that is the amount of games within that genre that get, I believe, over 500 reviews, which is quite a massive amount, that is quite huge. And the green bars are basically simply the number of games within that tag. So basically, if your goal is to make games as a living, if so, then you should be picking genres on the left side of this graph as opposed to the right side. So over here on the left side, we've got RTS, fighting games, city builder, FPS, farming, building, management, survival, and so on. So we can see on those games, about 20% of them reach the 500 review mark. That is a very high amount. 500 reviews is quite a lot. Again, back to doing our math, if we do 500 times 40, 500 reviews would be about 20,000 copies. That would instantly put you on the top 2-3% of indie games on Steam. And conversely, on the other side, over here we've got 3D platformer, top-down shooter, shoot 'em up, puzzle platformer, and so on. If you make games on these genres, then the odds of you getting 500 reviews on your game are pretty much about 4-5%. I really recommend you go watch this full video. It's some really interesting data analysis on this whole topic. But the idea of this is quite simple, is how genre matters an insane amount. And if you're trying to make games as a living, again, I really got to stress that point. Everything that I'm saying here only applies if you're trying to make games as a living. If you're trying to make games as a hobby, then just do whatever you want. If you want to make a puzzle platformer just for fun, then go ahead, just do that. As long as you're not expecting it to sell a million copies, then you're probably fine. But if you are trying to make games as a living, then definitely pay attention to your genre. Another excellent resource on this topic is this blog post by Chris Zikowski. Chris is a Steam marketing expert. I did a bunch of really nice videos with him. Definitely go watch all of these videos if you want to get a ton of marketing knowledge. If you understand everything in these videos, then your odds of finding success with your games go up by a massive amount. And Chris is actually doing a summer sale right now. So if you want to get a ton of Steam game marketing knowledge, 
If you want to get all that knowledge condensed into just one place, if so, then check out the Summer Sale and all his courses. I myself have been reading Chris's blog since 2018, so I can definitely recommend everything that he's teaching. So if you want to learn CM game marketing, check out the link in the description to see all the free videos that I did with him and pick up his course using the nice summer discount. But anyway, so he made this really interesting blog post, basically what are crafty bounty strategy simulation games. So this is roughly the genre on Steam or collection of genres on Steam that are very, very popular. If you want to make successful games, then yep, you should be making crafty bounty strategy simulation games. He talks about some examples of these kinds of games. So for survival games, you got something like Valheim, that's definitely an excellent game. Astroneer, that was also really awesome. On the smaller side, you got something like Forge, I really love that game. Then City Builders, that is another potentially hot genre. You've got Mineral Lords, that was a massive hit, I believe, last year. Timberborn, this one has been an insane hit that has been going for a long time. Islanders is a great small indie game. Then Base Building Tower Defense, this genre can also do very well. Diplomacy is not an option, that was a really interesting one. I always love looking at this game just to see the massive amount of units. Basically, the only way that this game actually exists is thanks to using Unity Dots. If you want to learn all about dots and how you can write code that runs 200 times faster, literally, if so, then go ahead, check out my free dots course. Then you've got Spaceship Builders, another really great hot genre. Cosmoteer, this was one that I've only was in development for about 10 years. This was in development for quite a while. This is a very deep space game, and it's definitely the kind of game that players on Steam absolutely love. So this one has 10,000 reviews. That's a massive amount. And then, of course, you've got the job simulator games. So things like House Flipper 2, Farming Simulator, Power Bar Simulator, Car Mechanic Simulator, Crime Scene, Contraband Police. All of these are insane hits. And like I was saying a while ago, all of these, in terms of mechanics, they're actually relatively simple. Most of these games are what I like to call interaction games. You really just move around the character, look at something, and interact with that something. And it's basically the theme that you want to play on top that causes the difference between all of these games. So on this one specifically, you're cleaning some kind of crime scene. Whereas on TCG Card Shop Simulator, on this one, you are standing up and managing some kind of trading card store. On Supermarket Simulator, you are managing a supermarket. On Contraband Police, you are basically looking for contraband. So essentially, yep, all of these games are, like I said, really just an interaction system with a very interesting skin attached on top. I actually attempted to make one of those games a while ago, specifically just to test out my own code monkey token asset. So in this one, I include a really nice interaction system. And basically, I just took that, I used that interaction system and made a really nice Shop Simulator prototype. Which if you want, you can pick up the stone kit, you can go ahead and look into this prototype and basically just take it as a base, apply a different skin on top, and with that, perhaps you've got a game kind of like this that makes millions of dollars. So yeah, the takeaway from this video is how genre really does matter quite a lot. Again, specifically for trying to make games as a living. If so, then don't just pick the first idea that comes to your mind. Go watch that video that I mentioned. Go watch this analysis on genres and how well each genre sells. And if you want to make things a little bit easier on yourself, then go ahead, pick a game idea that is on the left side of this chart as opposed to the right side. If you do that, if you pick the right idea, the right genre, if so, then finding success becomes much easier as opposed to if you pick the quote unquote wrong idea, wrong genre, where even if you make something that looks absolutely stunning, absolutely gorgeous, if so, you are really just climbing uphill. It is going to be much, much more difficult as opposed to if you pick a genre that is much easier on scene. By the way, on this example, I really don't want you to take the lesson that visuals do not matter. The reason why Supermarket Simulator found success was not because of its, let's say, lacking visuals. It found success despite of it. If we look over here on SteamDB, we can try to see how many wishlists the game had before release. And if we go and see, at the beginning, the game had pretty much very few wishlists. Look at that, for a few months, this was from October to about January, February, it only had about 2,000 wishlists, so a very low amount. That is because the visuals are very much subpar. So just based on the visuals themselves, the game did not find wishlists. It did not find success based on that. Basically, the game really only blew up in wishlists. And by the time it launched into early access, it already had 70,000 wishlists. That's a massive amount. And the way that it got that was by publishing a demo. So I really just want to be clear with that. Do not take the lesson that from this game, basically visuals don't matter. That is not the lesson here. Here, the visuals did not help this game. It actually hurt it. But once they published a demo and people saw that the gameplay was really excellent, that's when the game really blew up, and when players saw that the gameplay was really excellent, they were able to look past the, let's say, more basic visuals. Again, if you want to learn about Steam game marketing, I really recommend you watch all the videos that I did with Chris Zukowski. Chris has an insane amount of Steam marketing knowledge, so if you want to learn how to get more wish lists and get more sales, then I highly recommend you look through these videos and check out his course, which are currently on sale during his really awesome summer sale. And if you want to learn more on the technical aspect on how to make games, if so, then I'm also running a summer sale myself. You can get all my courses and all my games, Get a ton of knowledge in one bundle with one deep discount. Check out everything with the link in the description. Alright, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.